coffee break. I'm Lahiro and I'm Stan. And again, another very special episode. So Stan has asked Frank Sun, the creator of Mac95, to come on our very, uh, very informative podcast. So I might get Stan to introduce Frank and yeah, let's get started. Um, so look, there are very few moments in life where I think, uh, you know, you've got someone who has pivoted or revolutionized the way that, you know, we do primary teaching. So I can, you know, Amanda Diaz, um, you got the deranged physiology, you've got Stuart Watson with Ketamine Nightmares, and Frank Sun is definitely one of them who has changed the way that we learn um, primary physiology with the ANSCAR exam. And he's passionate about primary exam teaching. Uh, he's a public consultant at Liverpool Hospital, and he's done so much work with Mac95. And I think it was created about 2018. Is that is that right, Frank? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, yeah, and it's something that I think I've only discovered in the last two years. And, you know, through word of mouth, I can tell you that uh, 99% of uh, tra our trainees, and I think trainees around Australia, use this really functional app. And I'm so appreciative of Frank here today because he's going to give us a deep dive in terms of how to use all the functionalities of this app to actually create a platform uh, for success for this primary exam. So Frank, welcome and thank you so much. Great, thanks so much for inviting me onto the show. Um, yeah, well, I guess I might start off just with a, a bit of background of how it all started to give you a bit of context. Um, so I sat my primary in way back in 2004. And then I didn't think about primary stuff at all until I started getting involved in teaching at Liverpool in 2017. And at that time, I knew that um, they'd revised the syllabus in 2013. And so I thought, okay, well, I, you know, if I'm going to teach, I better get myself um, very familiar with this new syllabus. So then I downloaded uh, the, uh, the, those targeted uh, primary learning objectives. And uh, I really didn't like the format that they're in. And I think it's because they've tried to integrate it into the whole curriculum, which is much more of a clinical framework where everything was, you know, classified under, uh, you know, sedation and general anesthesia, perioperative medicine. Uh, but it's not really something that I, I could really use, um, you know, to study from. So it all, all began from me just trying to get myself organized uh, in terms of trying to teach. And so I thought, oh, I'm much more familiar with the, the old, old style topics of respiratory physiology, you know, cardiovascular physiology, so forth. And so I just started uh, kind of taking all of those learning outcomes and reclassifying them onto those more familiar topics. And then um, it, it kind of snowballed from there uh, because I, I'd, I'd had some of my trainees who said, okay, my plan for study is to uh, look at past this AQs and study from the model answers that are available. And they weren't planning to look at the learning outcomes at all. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, I was a bit shocked by that. And so the, the, the initial impetus was to try and um, encourage my trainees to kind of use the syllabus to make sure that they don't have any gaps in their knowledge. Um, and then I thought, okay, we know, well, it would be useful to have the SAQs there at the same time um, under the same topics. And uh, yeah, kind of uh, all, all developed from there. Hey, Frank, that's really interesting because I probably did study the way your, I think one of your trainees studied, which is, look, I'm, I'm just going to do the past SAQs. And my reason for that was that if I did the past SAQs, all the major topics would be covered because they essentially, you know, respiratory physiology, mm. all the learning objectives have been asked. But then if I went to, let's see, um, uh, uh, you know, to ba basic physiology concepts or pharmacokinetics or cellular physiology, there's like so, there's just as many learning points potentially, but some of those SAQs have never been asked or the learning objectives have never been asked in the SAQ format. So I think for me, there was a percentage play, where's the best use of my brain and how much can I possibly learn in the, this, uh, this time frame? But what, what do you think of that? Oh, I definitely think that you you need to be a bit strategic as you are. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, ideally, we can just say know everything in the entire syllabus. But I think for most people, that's kind of not realistic. Mm -hmm. And uh, you do, you know, my advice would be that the core topics, you know, they're guaranteed like 
respiratory physiology, cardiovascular physiology, there's guaranteed to be at least one question on those topics in the SAQ paper, sometimes even two. Mm. Um, and, and because those are the more core topics, which are very clinically relevant to our practice, um, you know, your, your depth of understanding will be, uh, the expectation will be a lot higher. So you want to definitely want to focus more time on those topics and make sure that you understand them. Uh, whereas the more peripheral topics, uh, yeah, like uh, the, you know, scavenging, describing active and passive scavenging systems, like, uh, you know, those sort of topics, you, you try and have the knowledge so you can actually at least say something about it and hopefully get the, to the two out of five. Um, but because those topics, they're, they're much less likely to come up, um, then, you know, you don't want to, yeah, you're not, you're not spending as much time on those sort of things as on the core topics. Yeah, but, but you, you would still cover them, but in a glancing, much less effort kind of way, but still yeah. the same principle apply, do what is common commonly and uh, get through the core topics. Yeah, absolutely. So that would be my re recommendation is for whatever topic you're studying is to, first of all, look over the, the list of learning objectives. Um, and then, uh, so you get, yeah, get an idea in your head of what are the things you're expected to know. And then I'd, I'd look over the, the list of related SAQs as well. And there you'll see, yeah, that, that'll give you a better idea of, you know, what's important and, and you will see what questions are, are being repeated. So uh, I think uh, with that strategy, you, yeah, you already, because when you first start a topic, sometimes you, you have no idea what's important and what's not important. And by looking over the SAQs, I, I think that gives you a better idea of, you know, what might be important uh, even before you start your, your study so that when you do then read about that topic, it'll click in your mind and you think, oh, yeah, I remember seeing that, you know, this sounds like it might be important and I better pay a bit more, more attention. Hey, yeah, I, so I think the, uh, I was going to say, uh, the official line from the college is definitely to cover all the syllabus. And hmm. I think that one of the, um, you know, points in terms of why trainees don't cover the syllabus as sort of Lahiru sort of pointed out is because of a time factor is because they, they just don't feel they have the time. Mm -hmm. But I think this is where, you know, what we are, or what you have created and what we are also on about is, you know, to really quicken up that learning curve. And so that trainees become a lot more efficient and, and allow you to actually have that extra time to actually cover those, those topics, which they may not have in the past. So, you know, the, the reason why Ladin covered that, those topics was because he didn't have Mac 95 back when he sat uh, in, uh, when was that, 2009, 2010? Yeah, 2009. And you, you might be absolutely right. But I mean, is there a proof of concept here? As in, we, we, you know, we, this is almost a study we should do. People that do syllabus and people that do just the past SAQs. Well, and you know, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, like for, for me to cover the syllabus, I'm going to be honest with you, it took me 18 months. 18 months to cover, to cover the syllabus. And, you know, what we recommend for almost all our trainees is to do a, a year. But for, mm -hmm. me, for, me to actually, for me to actually cover everything, it actually took me 18 months. And this was a time when we could sit the exams separately. So that's yeah. why, you know, I, I could initially study for one and then thought, oh, look, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'll sit both. But that's where my sort of 18 months sort of came from. Stan, just to clarify, did you study 18 months to sit one exam and decide, actually, I'm going to sit both. No, no. no. So I, studied, I studied six months to sit one exam and I went, oh, six months, probably, you know, it was sit the physiology exam and I went, oh, look, you know, I'm, I'm this close in. I'm also just sit both now and then, and then, you know, got into anesthetic training and then after that set that exam sort of a year later. So, yeah. So it literally was 18 months in total. And I think that probably is why I was able to cover um, the broad, Topics, but you know, if, if I had something like Mac ninety five, because I remember I was going through the I was going through the curriculum. It was in a red book uh, at that time, and I remember sort of ticking off each each objective. And then there was also a green book by a guy called Fonsi. I don't know whether you've ever used. Uh, oh yeah, Fonsi. Uh, the yeah. bright green book, the big one. Yeah, the green yeah. book. I was trying and, to find that again. Uh, <laughs> hey Frank, I've got a, I've got a copy if you if you want to have a look. <laughs> Yeah, because it, 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 it was just a massive set of notes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. Because yeah. um, people have asked me, like in my program, I've got a very specific definition of Mac. And people have asked, oh, where does this come from? And it came from that book. But then, I, oh, yeah, I could mm -hmm. never find it again. Oh. Hey, so we've got a few kind of questions to basically ask you. So maybe just to keep it organized, we'll start by asking you about 
Mac 95, its evolution, you know, how, how, how you, you told us how you came up with it um, and maybe so what it is now, how it's evolved, where it's going from here. Um, yep. And then also asking you like, you know, why'd you call it Mac 95 with a K instead of a C? What's up with that? Um, but also then maybe broadly speaking, getting, getting your exam tips and, you know, do you think you need to study 18 months to get through the syllabus and things like that? Um, so we might start with, um, what, why, why Mac 95, M-A-K 95? Yeah, well, I'm surprised. I, I thought it was quite obvious what it would mean, <laughs> but, you know, clearly it's the, the Mac 95 with the C and based off that, yeah. um, and the similar concept. So it's, uh, you know, uh, Initially, I was just going to call it you know, ANSCA primary or something like that. And then I thought, oh, it sounds a bit too official and a little bit boring. And then I was trying to think, you know, what, what's my, what do I want this app to do? And like, so Mac 95 is the minimum anesthetic knowledge you need to have a 95% chance of passing <laughs> is my intention behind that. <laughs> That's that great. I is love a it. brilliant love name. It. I didn't know that. Do you, do, you, do you say that on your website or on the app? Uh, no, <laughs> I put it in my FAQ just to say it's derived from the normal Mac and yeah. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll leave it and let you figure it out. <laughs> That's, I, I love the name. That's actually a, a brilliant concept for a name. Uh, it's really cool. <laughs> yeah, um, and, is... and how has it evolved then? So, you, I mean, it sounds like you started with, I'm going to teach this. I need to get through the learning objectives. I need to attach SAQs to that. Yeah, so it started off the core functionality was uh, the learning objectives and the SAQs um, kind of uh, classified under those topics. And I wanted uh, my trainees to you know, tick off the learning objectives so that they don't miss anything and to be able to yeah, very uh, easily kind of access the, the related SAQ. So that was kind of the first version is what there was. And then, uh, yeah, initially I was you know, debating on whether I should add on the links to all the different model answers that are available. Uh, because on the one hand, it is very convenient to be able to, you know, click and see someone else's ideas on how to answer a particular question. But on the other hand, I thought, oh, am I just encouraging people to get bad study habits? Because I think, uh, you know, one way that it can be misused or not used as I intend it to be is that um, it might encourage people to kind of not do their own study, but just read the model answer and say, okay, I've learned that. Um, uh, in the end, I decided that, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's worthwhile to have the convenience of having it all linked together. Um, but certainly I would encourage people that when you do study a topic, you should, you know, everyone's got their own favorite uh, textbooks and, and resources. And I think you need to kind of read widely um, and not just one, you know, particular set of notes or one textbook uh, but once you've you know done your own study for a, a particular topic then I think uh, you can test yourself with the SAQs and then that's when you look at the examiner's reports and the model answers and see you know if you were on the right track or not um, but that kind of to me should be kind of the last thing you do in your study of a topic rather than the basis of your study yeah and yeah. so now that uh, maybe, maybe it's a good time to actually share, share your screen and kind of take us through uh, Mac 95 uh, yeah, yeah. and its functionality. Okay. So apologies for the podcast listeners, but um, I'll have this video on YouTube where you can follow along um, with Frank as he orientates us to Mac 95. Okay. So hopefully that's uh, come up. So um, yeah, this dashboard screen, uh, it's a few ideas behind this. I just want to give people a, a very quick overview of, of where they're at in their study so that you plug in uh, the, the sitting that you're, you're going for, and then it'll give you, you know, your timeline of uh, how much more time you have, <laughs> have left to study. And when you're ticking off your learning objectives and so forth, I wanted to yeah, you know, put the pressure on people and make sure that they're keeping... Uh, you know, keeping up on their on their uh, study timetable, because that was one thing that I was a bit surprised that not everyone. I, I, I thought that everyone would, you know, at the start of their study would sit down, write down a, a timetable, budget time for each topic, and make sure that you have. I, I recommend at least two months of uh, revision time before uh, the written paper. Um, but again, I, I was a bit surprised that um, not everyone does that. <laughs> Uh, you know, some people just say, oh, I'm aiming to sit in August, but I'll see how I go. 
And I really think that you're not doing yourself uh, any favors with that sort of uh, mindset because unless you've got a set timetable, you know, there's nothing to motivate you. Um, so if you know, okay, I've got 12 months and uh, I've given myself six or eight weeks or whatever to do respiratory physiology and you get to the end of that eight weeks and you say, oh, I, I'm, I'm behind, uh, then you know you have to change something and, and, and uh, yeah, up, up the ante a little bit. Yeah, um, I think that's very important. And, and that's why I then integrated uh, the uh, being able to build in a study plan. And so, you know, this is not a, a new idea. I've got this on in, in the app. I know on, on your website, on the Anesthesia Collective, you also have a recommended timetable. Mark Reeves, the primer, has a recommended timetable. Propofol Dreams has a, a recommended timetable. So it, it doesn't really matter which one you're using. They're all just trying to get you into the ballpark. Um, but the idea here uh, was that I wanted, let me just reset it so I can change things here. Um, but once you've set your, your date, okay, let me just put it as August, uh, that I, I wanted people to really um, realize how much of a commitment uh, studying for the exam is. So, uh, that the, the, the official recommendation is a thousand hours of study and over 12 months, uh, that's 20 hours a week. And so uh, at Liverpool Hospital, the average registrar working week is I think 56 hours. So you're now adding 20 hours of work, a study on top of that. That's not really leaving much time for any sort of personal life. And I, I think that's uh, one thing that I feel a lot of registrars when they're first, you know, thinking about studying for the exam is they don't realize <laughs> how much of a, a commitment it is. And so this was to try and encourage people to... Um, and that yeah. was, I found that that was, yeah, really, um, you know, challenging because I remember I, I felt lucky because in, uh, I had ICU for one rotation kind of leading up to the exam, like maybe six months before the exam, which was perfect, mm -hmm. seven days on, seven days off. And that seven days off, I could knock out so many topics. Um, but then, I mean, that said, I still had to, I, I reckon I took five weeks of annual leave to study um, for my exam, which is, a, you know, all the annual leave I had. And, you know, that's kind of brutal because you, you shouldn't need to do that as a welfare type system. But I, I just didn't know how to cover it without taking the annual leave. And it just felt really brutal. Yeah. And that's kind of, unfortunately, <laughs> that's what the exam is, is like. And so when I said it, I was single, had no commitments. And so just for a year of my life was just work and then study. Uh, whereas, you know, for people who have a, a family with young kids, I think it's much more difficult uh, for someone in that sort of situation where, you know, they do have other commitments that you can't just, you know, completely <laughs> ignore. Um, but uh, that's what I wanted to try and yeah, encourage people to really, you know, uh, recognize how much uh, of a time commitment it is and that you need to plan around that. Um, so I, I would say that you, you need quality study time. And so you can't just if you come home from work and you're tired. You can't you know, say I'm studying, but looking after two young kids at the same time. You know, that's not going to be effective study. So you really have to. Um, you know, think about how can you give yourself good quality study time. And so I think some sort of concrete uh, advice would be things like if you're a morning person and you can get up early and do one or two hours of study before work, that's good. Or if you can't study at home because there's too many distractions, uh, then, you know, you should find somewhere at work or at a local library or somewhere where, where you aren't distracted. Um, and to try and really outsource any sort of chores that you can outsource, like uh, hiring a cleaner, hiring babysitter, getting you know, meal delivery service, all of those things in terms of uh, it's going to be cheaper to pay for all of those things than it is to resit the exam. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think the first step is really recognising what a big deal this exam is and, and allowing enough time for you to, to get through all the material. And, and that's really good advice, uh, Frank, so that for all the trainees out there that, uh, you know, are planning this exam, all those other things, you know, and especially nowadays, you know, those services, those extra services that uh, often take up, you know, our day to day life. I think that uh, we, we just need to, you know, delegate those tasks and, and even pay for those tasks for someone else to do, to do those. 
Um, hey, Frank, I want to ask you a question. So, so for a new trainee that's just downloaded your app, um, the, the plan would be to go to um, the study plan first. And I know that you've got the start date here, but there was another one which also had the exam or when your oh, exam was on the, on the screen. Here. Sorry, yeah, this one actually should be the start date, not the exam date. So let me... So this is, so this is the start date. And then can I ask you, if you were to set your exam date, does this start date, does it tell you when you should start? Um, if you want to do a thousand hours? Is... Uh, no, it's kind of the opposite. So uh, since in the dashboard, I put down August date for the written, so it'll appear in the calendar there. Um, but uh, say if I choose uh, this one, starting it on that date, uh, then it'll kind of pre-fill it with my sort of default times. Uh, but obviously, you, you know, you can adjust it, or change change the durations and so forth. Um, but obviously, you need to yeah, plan it out so that uh, you're covering everything uh, before the written. And yeah, in my default, I kind of give, I think, eight weeks of uh, revision time. And so uh, the idea is here uh, is I wanted people to uh, you know, play around with this and actually, you know, change things for themselves and actually realize how, you know, how much time it's going to take them to cover everything. Such, such a powerful tool. And, and I can see how um, once you've got your exam date, you know, you decide when your start date is and just this pre-filled calculation, I think, I think just takes that whole sort of mind off in terms of that other trainees have used this to successfully pass or do well for this exam. So this is a this is a tried and true formula in terms of the distribution of workload. And I like how it just automatically calculates. So it, it does it just just through a fraction. Is that how it does yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So I just uh, yeah I think I based it on a uh, let's see I think it was my efficient one with well, I think yeah I think it was uh, initially something like ten months of study. Because uh, I, I, I think that's about how much I did. And then, um, yeah, so I kind of <laughs> tried to remember how much time I spend on each topic and, and, and put it in. But it, again, it's only to get you into, into a ballpark, really, and everyone's going to be a bit different. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to encourage people to really think about yeah, the timetable. And, and then efficient average more time is just how, how long? Uh, oh, yes, it changes, uh, yeah, you know, the total hours studied and then how many hours per day you're wanting to study. So it was to, the idea was to try and yeah, encourage people to, because you could change, uh, change those numbers and it'll, you know, recalculate everything for you. And, uh, I, yeah, I just don't think people uh, don't really kind of recognize that it's 20 hours a week for 12 months. That's a huge time commitment. And, and that's yeah. kind of you know, just an average. No, I, I like I like how you've got um, the, the range, which is what we hear all the time. You know, we've, we've had trainees who've just gone, I've studied 500 hours and passed this exam. And then we've had other trainees who've studied a lot more and struggled. Um, but, you know, you've, you've gone, you've described it perfectly. 500 to eight hours may be enough if you study efficiently and effectively. A thousand hours is the average. And I think the other side to it is that you may actually need more. Um, than a thousand hours you know you may need 1200 you may need 1500 hours so th those are really things to sort of take into consideration and understanding yourself in terms of how you study and how you learn because I think everyone studies and learns uh, differently and uniquely mm. um, and so so from here where where should the trainee go after they've created this this study plan what's the what's the next step uh yep so um, personally, I think it makes the most sense to start with respiratory physiology, and that's by far the, the biggest topic out of everything, uh, with cardiovascular physiology being the second biggest, but um, even, even that is significantly smaller than respiratory. And I think, to me, respiratory is the topic that has the most, you know, the most confusing concepts that take the longest to get your head around. Um, but the, the upshot of doing that first is that once you have covered it, kind of every you kind of start reusing those concepts that you've learned in other areas and everything else kind of starts to get easier and easier um so you know again it doesn't really matter which which uh topic you start off with it's whatever you know you feel makes the most sense to you and also some people might kind of do the 
physiology side of things plus the related pharmacology at the you know at the same time whereas I guess I'm biased that I I sat them separately like you and I did physiology first and then pharmacology uh, next so but in you know I, I found I, mine works a bit better that way having separate I, topics I found one of the great advantages of so my plan was respiratory then cardiovascular and then the five you know farm topics volatiles opioids local mm -hmm. muscle relaxants induction agents and because I did the core stuff straight away, especially RESP, it meant that, you know, most of the people you talk to consultants wise, they remember RESP and cardio, but they mm -hmm. don't really remember thyroid and endocrine or, you know, whatever. And so when you're at work and you say, let's talk about first part stuff, you're going to constantly be reinforced respiratory stuff. But chances are, if you've just studied, yeah, pharmacokinetics, they might not remember it in the detail that you need to. So that was helpful. Yeah. And uh, definitely personally, like I find respiratory physiology is the most interesting um, and and you'll, you'll see in my uh, study notes that I've included in the app is mostly uh, respiratory stuff. Um, so, but uh, yeah, so whatever the topic is, you would, uh, I recommend you'd go, say if we're doing respiratory, uh, that uh, you've got uh, your list of learning objectives. So I would read, read uh, through those to get an idea before you start studying that topic, um, you know, what you're expected to know. And then uh, go to the short answer question section. And again, just, you know, glance over all of the, the past SAQs in those uh, related topics. And you can see uh, the questions that keep getting repeated. So you kind of know that uh, this is probably a more important uh, topic that I, I need to pay attention to when I get to it. Um, so uh, once you've you know, looked at those areas, then then you'd go away and do your study. And I think, uh, personally, I think you should have one main textbook uh, that you read through. And then uh, if, if you find that you're not satisfied that uh, you understand the concept from that textbook, then you should find something else, either online or another textbook um, and, and, and read until you're, you're satisfied that you understand it. So for me, uh, for respiratory physiology, I would recommend reading West as the main textbook. And then if you're not happy, I mean, that's a very good textbook. And uh, uh, But there are a couple of topics where I think it, it doesn't cover that well, uh, such as the static versus dynamic compliance. And so then in that case, I, I would go to nuns and, and read, read the section in there. Um, of course, now there's all these other online resources available as well. So um, that's why yeah, recently I linked in um, in the learning objectives to the uh, Life in the Fast Lane Part 1 website and also to the Derange Physiology website. And, and so if you can't find something uh, in a textbook that uh, explains something to your satisfaction, you know, most likely if you go to one of these ones, you'll, you'll find something where you think, okay, now I, now I get it. Hey, Frank, what are, what are the shortcuts? What's PL, MR, RC? I thought this is a, a primary learning objective of the day. Yep. Uh, so that'll uh, yeah open their website and search for that um, learning outcome in any Very nice. posts. And then MR is the Mark Reeves uh, one that opens up to the his uh, Google um, Sheets that has the true false questions. Mm -hmm. And then uh, yes, yeah, so life in the fast lane, the Drench physiology, and then the related concepts is my uh, kind of internal uh, notes that are linked to those. Oh, that's so that's you've got a range nice. of options because everyone's. Yeah, we all have our own preferences because uh, I think everyone thinks in a slightly different way. And so someone's style of writing is going to resonate with you and another one is just not going to make sense. Mm. And so you've got to find the thing like the textbook and or the website that kind of <laughs> syncs with your, your brain. Yeah, I, I remember literally I'd just go to Wikipedia so often, for, like especially for definitions and kind of mm. going through more of the electrical concepts and physics and measurement. Found that so useful, but yeah. Uh, when I think when we were going through, we unfortunately we didn't have all these very very good websites. But that's such a cool little tool there. Yeah. So then, um, yeah. So then, once you've done your study, uh, then I think it's worthwhile to uh, set yourself a uh, test test yourself. Uh, so I've got this uh, random test function that you can either choose a specific topic or or let it um, you know choose choose them all, and then uh, set set yourself a test. Uh, so. Just as an example, that one, just respiratory, it'll come up with a random set of uh, 10 respiratory questions. And then again, once you've done them either as a full SAQ or just the show me the money sort of exercise, then uh, 
you can uh, then access all of those links again um, and see if there's a, you know, anything in particular that you missed. Um, yeah, so what I'd recommend is to do your own study for the topic. And then when you do your SAQ practice, then uh, yeah, start looking at the examiner's reports, which are linked in there. And, and then also looking at the model answers that are, are available as well. Um, oh, it's so, very nice. Yeah. yeah. And then I think uh, for me with the MCQs is kind of something you do after you've finished studying the topic. So I, I feel like the MCQs is kind of a good test of how, you know, how effectively you've covered a topic is. Um, it's not something that you learn from really. It's more a test of <laughs> how well you've learned the topic already. Um, because I, I think reading broadly around from different sources, that's where you pick up uh, the, the knowledge to answer these sort of MCQs. Uh, because it, uh, as the examiners have said, it's very difficult to set an MCQ that tests understanding. It's more they have to kind of set it to test knowledge and and uh it has to be it ends up being a little bit esoteric the knowledge because otherwise it becomes too easy and and, and a bit pointless uh so i think if you're a bit too focused in your study in terms of just reading summaries of um topics and not really reading a, a more comprehensive uh source then you don't really pick up the knowledge uh you need to answer the mcqs um, so I'd use the MCQs more as a test of uh, your knowledge after you've studied a topic. And also in conjunction with these inbuilt MCQs is I would go to the um, primary learning objective of the day and the Mark Reeves primer and, and do the true false questions from there as well. Um, and I think that will give you a good, um, yeah, a good preparation for the MCQ section. And, and with the MCQs, Frank, uh, I understand that uh, ANSCA has said that that they don't want you to sort of publish any more new ones uh, um, yes um yes yeah, so i got contacted uh yeah by the chair of examinations and to ask me to to yeah, not publish any a, a new mcqs um their rationale is that they consider it cheating and the main impetus is that uh, that they feel like they don't want to have a situation where some people have access to this bank of past questions and other people don't. Uh, and so they feel it's uh, a bit unfair that way. And then also uh, influences the integrity of the examination process. Um, of course, like, you know, it, it, there's still a huge bank that's already available. And I think, you know, people are still remembering the questions and uh, it might not be, it might be a bit more underground now, but you can, I think people still can get their hands on the yeah. more recent questions. Um, and I feel like uh, by making the, that MCQ section just pass fail, I think they've kind of almost solved the problem in that you can't, um, the, the issue before from what I've told was that um, people could do really well in the MCQ section because they've seen all the questions before, and but their knowledge isn't very good. They scrape through the SAQs, you know, borderline fail the, um, the vivas, but then pass overall because of this great MCQ uh, pass rate. Um, but I think by, you know, making it pass fail and not having it count towards the actual score has kind of fixed that. And, and when they did change it, I saw, you know, the pass rate immediately dropped by 10%. Uh, so I think it did have the effect they, that they were looking for. I think, um, <clears throat> and just the ability to go through past MCQs, it has a lot of advantages. I mean, the amount of knowledge, you know, assessment drives performance in many ways. And the fact that I've got to, you know, there's an MCQ there, I have to look at it. I've got to think about it and then make a judgment. There's multiple steps in learning. Whereas mm. if I had no MCQs to go by, you know, I would just be reading a book with no context. And yeah. that makes a lot less sense to me for learning, if that's what we're after. Mm. Yeah, so I think, yeah, to me, uh, yeah, I don't know if I agree with the, the policy of, of trying to not, you know, or discourage uh, the re remembered MCQs because uh, yeah I, I'm the same I think it does help to drive learning I know it's, it's a it's a really topical issue and I think that uh, it's something that I I understand it's the complexity of having an exam twice a year and trying to create new questions twice a year you know mm. 150 new questions twice a year um, but it, it's almost inevitable isn't it that that when you've got you know 200 trainees sitting an exam there's going to be bound 
to have people remember them and they, they're going to have people going to be constructing, you know, an MCQ bank. And it's, it's definitely around and available, I think, but probably not in a, in a such a wide space. And I know they talk to you about equality, but I think that probably creates a lot more inequality because then you've got, you know, little groups who are, well, who are well organized, who can actually get those answers and then others who can't. So, but you know, I think we, we, as always, we always play by the rules in terms of what we're given. And, and these are the rules that ANSCA has defined so that, uh, you know, we just play by the rules and we just do our best to maximize our, our chances. And I think as Frank said, you know, it's a pass fail. So all you need to do is just, is just pass the um, MCQs. Now, now, interesting, did you know, Frank, that the new MCQs that are out, they only have four, um, four yeah. answers instead of five. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, certainly at the refresher course, uh, Dr. David Faye was speaking about that and saying that they found that it's very hard to write that fifth distractor. Like it's kind of obviously wrong. So it, it, it doesn't really contribute anything. Like uh, having it as four, it, people don't guess it more often than if there's five and just makes it easier to, to write the MCQs. And so that makes sense. And so obviously all of the bank still has uh, the five stems. But I did, uh, when, I, when you do the test mode, if you generate a, a paper um, uh, as a PDF, it'll actually cut it down to four stems and randomize the stems for you to try and make them you know, less recognizable. Um, wow. So I've tried, I've tried yeah. to um, compensate for that change. That's some, that's some great programming skills you got there, Frank. <laughs> Doesn't so much of this. Uh, a lot of uh, trial and error. I was going to say, I, I really enjoyed the fifth stem because, you know, it, it just gave you that little confidence where you sort of went, I got a 20% chance of passing this. <laughs> oh, wait, there's one that's wrong. I've now increased yeah. my probability to 25%. <laughs> and he was just that, just that psychological boost. But now, now it's, uh, now you got to, now you got to go from 25 to try to exclude <laughs> one to uh, one out of three or even one out of two. Um, and, and so Frank, you, do you have any background programming skills at all? Um, no, not at all. So it's, uh, I, think, I think it all started, I'm, I'm sure everyone, all of us have used sort of Microsoft Excel to do some sort of spreadsheet work. And then uh, when, when you play around with that, you see how you can do those formulas to make it do automatic calculations for you. And you think, oh, wow, that's you know, really convenient. Uh, and then I think programming is just kind of an extension of that. Uh, so I think the next step, for me was uh, when I was doing my formal project, uh, which is now the scholar role, um, but I did an audit of um, the pre-anesthetic clinic and, and what tests were being ordered for different types of operations. And uh, the clinic nurse was gonna collect all of this data for me. So I thought, oh, you know, that, that's really nice of them. I wanna try and make it easy for them. And so I was trying to look at what's, you know, how can I make it easy for them to kind of log all of this data. And I came across uh, Microsoft Access, which is a database program, uh, which is kind of just a, it's kind of like Excel on steroids. It's a kind of bit more functionality. And then, so I, I learned a little bit, uh, you know, some basic programming on how to use Microsoft Access as a database program uh, to do that so that uh, they could collect, easily collect the data. And so that was kind of the intermediate step for me for before, yeah, when I was thinking of trying to do something that became, ended up being Mac 95 is that uh, I was, you know, had that little bit of experience and then I thought, oh, I wonder, you know, half of my trainees use Mac, half of my trainees use Windows. I need something that's going to work on both. And so initially uh, I was searching around and, and came across something called FileMaker, um, which uh, yeah, is something that allows you to create apps for both Windows and, and Mac. And so I, I, you know, went through the, their tutorial and the, the, the uh, computer programming language and it, yeah, kind of, and then you just learn things online and it kind of uh, a lot of trial and error. And it's so this is all, uh, is this essentially a FileMaker app? Uh, so now this one is uh, made with Zojo. Mm -hmm. um, I had to change from FileMaker because uh, they kind of changed from a bus their business model where I used to be able to make what's called a runtime app where no other people who want to use the app, they don't need to buy FileMaker themselves. That I can just create an app for them, uh, but they changed it so that to use the app, you also had to have FileMaker, which is 
I think $300 a year or 800 and something dollars as a once-off purchase. And I thought, oh, no one's going to do that. Yeah, <laughs> so wow. I was kind of forced to, to change over. But it's probably a bit fortuitous in that, uh, yeah, the Zojo is a bit more flexible. And so I've, I've been able to do yeah, more with it than I think I would have been able, able to uh, with the original one. That's a really great story because, like, it's, you know, when you see someone who's done something like this and you go, how, how did you possibly start? It actually started 10 years ago or 20 years ago when you were doing something else, you know, <laughs> and it all just kind of evolved very, very slowly. Yeah. And I think it's also, you know, a bit parallel to studying for the exam is that initially it seems a bit overwhelming. Like when I was first, first thinking about it, you know, I thought, oh, is programming, do I have to be like writing zeros and ones and how do I do anything basic? But it's not like that at all. And you have to break it up. It seems overwhelming. There's so much to learn, uh, same as for the exam. But once you break it up into little chunks and you focus on, okay, first I need to learn this little thing. And then you learn it and then it kind of snowballs after, after a while. Hey, Frank, so where would you go from here? So you've done the short answer. You looked at the learning objectives, studied your short answer questions, done some exam practice, gone through MCQs again, done some exam practice, where do you go from here? Um, yep, so I think um, what I'd say is that uh, you need to stick to your timetable and make sure that you have enough time, you've covered everything and, and given yourself, uh, you know, I recommend two months at least um, before the, the written paper for revision, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, the first time you read through all of this information, uh, you're not going to remember very much of it at all. Um, so the idea when you first read through, um, you're not trying to remember all of this information. What you're trying to do is make sure that you understand it and, and it kind of thinks, oh, yeah, this makes sense to me. So that when you make your notes, so you, you do your study, you write your notes from that. And then I think another essential step is to make flashcards from that. And whether it's, a, you know, I prefer the physical flashcards, but I think a lot of people now do it in an electronic format. Um, but uh, the idea is that you need to kind of take your notes and really condense it even further into just the key points for that particular topic. Um, because when you're you know, two, two months out from the written, you have not, you can't remember what you, you, you read 10 months ago. Um, so what you have to do, you know, it's taken you 10 months to cover the syllabus. In the next two months, you have to read the syllabus again, probably another two times at least. So you have to do that very quickly. And that's why the flashcards are essential because you don't have time to reread a textbook or something like that. You need to have a flashcard that you look at it and think, oh yes, that, that's right, I remember now. It, it kind of it makes it click in your brain and refreshes, refreshes your memory. Mm. Um, so I think- I totally agree. Mm -hmm. I, I think just the fact that I wrote flashcards for everything, even though I had a great set of notes, just writing it that extra time. Oh, yeah, I, I learned so much from that process. Mm. Yeah, so I think that's to me is an essential step. And then uh, the other thing is uh, before the, the written paper, again, initially I didn't kind of give this advice because I thought it was so obvious, but you need to at least do one full SAQ practice paper. And I've kind of come to realize that not everyone does that. Like some people say, oh, I only do five questions at a time. Um, but you need to do at least one. Um, full paper because you don't realize how tiring it is both physically and mentally to to write for two and a half hours like your hand cramps up if you're not used to to writing for that long and and, and also you mentally you get exhausted so you, you need to practice that um, so that that was uh yeah the motivation for um kind of adding in that pdf uh, version of being able to generate a paper as well to try and encourage people to you know sit a full practice paper under exam conditions. We've actually been uh, doing that as a group as well. And uh, I remember using your functionality to do a test version. And I think I went to, just for fun, just before the, um, just before the, the last sort of sitting, I think I did like the highest difficulty mode oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, for the 15 questions. And uh, tell you what, that was, that was definitely uh, challenging to uh, have <laughs> All those questions and and so to you like what is a difficult short answer question do you base it on the pass mark or like the last pass mark or the average pass mark 
Uh, yeah, so that one is just filtered by um, the yeah the pass pass rate. So I think if you hover over it, um, it'll yeah. So that's oh sorry, this is MCQs. Let me go to SAQs. Uh, so that'll be a hundred percent. This will select things less than sixty, and the hardest one is yeah only choosing questions less than a thirty percent. Um, yeah, but I think there's it's a bit different like a. The pass rate can be low either because it's a bit of an obscure topic that hasn't been asked before and therefore no one studied it, or it can also be a core topic that people are expected to know very well, and uh, then uh, yeah, then the quality of the answers isn't isn't up to scratch. And uh, that's another thing I'd, I'd like to point out is that I think uh, you shouldn't kind of overanalyze the examiner's reports, in that. Um, a lot of them, particularly the older ones, they're not kind of intended to be model answers. I think they were, the examiners sometimes just write on things that are a bit unusual. And it doesn't mean because it's mentioned in the report that this is a very important point. And so I think sometimes it can give people a skewed idea of how they should answer the question. So I think a prime example of that is the um, myocardial oxygen supply demand this one where you know the pass rate's only barely 50% for such a core topic. And what I think's happened is that in all of the examiner's reports, um, they've written, uh, you know, people use the Hagen Purcell equation and Ohm's law to divide it up. And then people have looked at that and said, oh, th that's how they want us to do it. Uh, we should write about deriving Ohm's law and the Hagen Purcell equation and talk about the factors affecting uh, um, resistance. And then in the next report, because people have done that same format, then they write the same thing and people get yeah, Ohm's law and so forth. And, and people end up kind of writing model answers that are actually quite bad uh, because that rather than answering the specific question where it should be about heart rate, diastolic time and diastolic pressure, they talk about Ohm's law and Poiseuille's law. And so I think you have to be a little kind of be a bit conscious that um, the examiner's reports, you know, they're fantastic resources to have, uh, but kind of don't over-interpret, um, yeah, what's written in them. Yeah. So you haven't, yeah, you haven't seen all the papers they've read and they're just commenting on because of the strangeness of the sample size or whatever. Um, yeah. yeah, that's really, but it's so funny that then that has driven practice in a sense. And like, I remember one in the part two exam, I think it was the 2007 papers, there's what, there was, a, a really great set of examiner's reports where, which were actually like model answers and I've based so many of my lectures on the inside of that exam paper and mm. you know there's just a it just seems like there's a lot of power in those examiner's reports and I wonder wouldn't it be great if they were model answers <laughs> you'd have everyone just smashing those questions every time mm. so we've talked about kind of the the revision part of things then as well um, yeah, what, what other aspects are there that people should kind of utilize? And there's survivors down there. Uh, uh, yeah, so this was, um, yeah, I think the core to me is the learning objectives, SAQs and MCQs. Yep. Uh, the survivors I then a bit later on added on all the opening question stems, uh, which, uh, you know, obviously anything that can be asked as an SAQ can also be asked as an, in, an, in a Viva format. So, you know, I didn't feel like there's a huge need to kind of try and expand this section that much. Uh, but having said that, uh, you know, some of my registrars, after they sit the exam, they try and write down the, the Viva questions they got for me. And so I have added on a few, few of them. So just to give people an idea of, you know, a, a, a you know, normal flow of questions, but there's nothing, uh, you know, uh, particularly unconventional about those. It's kind of the questions you should expect to be asked, uh, you know, after you've studied a particular topic. Um, so I think for the vivas, uh, after the the written paper, uh, you go. I think you should go into what I'm call just a maintenance mode. Like you're not trying to learn anything new. You're just trying to maintain all of this knowledge at the front of your mind, so that uh, when it comes to the viva time and they ask you a question, you can just bang out the answers. And so that's also a very painful period because it means that for the eight weeks you're just continuously reading those flashcards and you know trying to keep all of this information fresh in your head. And the problem is that uh, as soon as you stop doing that constant revision, it just starts leaching out. 
And everyone who's, uh, you know, done the exam has had that experience of, you know, after you've passed, you think, I've studied this so much, it's just going to be stuck into my brain now. But then a month or two later, you know, 80% of it is gone because you just haven't maintained that revision. Um, so after the written paper, uh, you're revising, constantly revising all of your flashcards and uh, trying to do some practice vivas. And I think to me, the kind of the aim of doing practice vivas is to get over that initial awkwardness of answering questions verbally. Um, we're not really used to doing it that way. And, it, you know, I certainly I felt like I was tripping over my tongue when I was trying to answer the questions. And so you have to get, do enough practice to get over that sort of awkwardness um, so that you feel comfortable answering questions verbally. Uh, I know a lot of people seem to say, oh, you should do a minimum of 50 practice fibers. Um, personally, I don't think that's really necessary. I think you do as long, enough that you feel comfortable that, you um, you're not going to get really stressed trying to answer questions verbally. Um, so I, I don't personally see a huge benefit in trying to aim for a huge number of practice fibers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of uh, the idea between yeah. the, behind and, that. And I, I mean, I found that it was just, um, I mean, obviously I just try to get as many vivas with anyone who's happy to give it to me, but I found that the, as soon as I got a, maybe a, one or two vivas that day, I'd have them written down afterwards. And then I'd pay it forward to my study mate or another, and I, you know, just having that nice little bank of questions where you can go, okay, this happened. But, you know, like a lot of things, it's the, you know, the history of Ansker is what kind of drives forward your learning in a way. So, you know, we Ansker doesn't ask every question, but they have asked questions in the past, and then those trainees teach the next generation, which teaches the next mm -hmm. generation, and it's just like this kind of pay it forward type system. So it's just so useful to you know if you've got that the contacts in that hospital to be able to you know run through those ex ex uh, vivas that that's generally speaking the style of question that ANSCA examiners have been asking and so you're trying to play the game uh in the in the way it's meant to be played by ANSCA yeah and and so Frank do you know some of the questions there they are just variations of uh the same idea is are these mm. questions the ones that they've listed in the exam booklet I mean, in the end in the uh exam in the or are these some um, questions that have been reported by trainees uh no so these are the ones that are actually in the the opening questions that are, i've taken out of the exam reports yeah and yeah, as you can see they're just variations of you know a very you know of the same idea like draw a lead to ecg draw lead to of an ecg mm -hmm. um draw a lead to ecg tracing they, they're just just phrased differently aren't they yeah mm -hmm. That's Please. great. There's a lot of uh, drawing EC tracing. I say, if there's one yeah. thing to do, draw that ECG. Trying to give a clue. Trying to give a clue to the uh, to the <laughs> trainee sitting in uh, May. Remember the yeah. remember how to draw Elite Two ECG. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't you love to get? Uh, it's always Lead Two, isn't it? <laughs> draw always Lead Two. Draw posterior yeah. ECG leads. That'll be a. Uh... Um and and now Frank, I want to quickly sort of ask you. I think we're we're sort of heading to an hour now. But um, you've got some other sections such as my resources, study notes. Uh, uh, yeah. How do you utilize those ones there? W what do you do there? Uh, so the my resources is uh, kind of what I intend to be a bit like a study drop box that if you come across uh, an article or PDF generally that you find useful, then it, it's just you can put it in here and to get uh, easy access to it. So, you know, I found uh, some useful, uh, yeah useful uh, articles. And so I'm trying to here again, encourage people to kind of read broadly uh, that uh, you know, if you usually you'll have your main source, whatever textbook uh, that you use, but you know, some, for some things, I think you have to, you're not satisfied that you understand what's going on. Uh, and then you have to search for something else and that can be online and, and it's very easy now with google you i'm sure you'll find something that will answer your question mm -hmm. and so yeah the idea here was just to help make it easy to kind of um aggregate all of these uh, uh resources that you find it's, it's funny uh, how you've um, shown an article laparoscopy abdominal surgery because i've literally referred to this exact article in the the last podcast we just did on on monday uh, that's, that's yeah. pretty funny <laughs> amazing yeah. article on laparoscopic abdominal surgery yeah, you can see that, you know, there's that uh, learning objectives that talks about yeah, um, the effects of pneumoperitoneum. And, you know, this answers that directly. 
Um, and so the study notes is uh, yeah, my own uh, notes. And uh, when you go through, you will see it's mainly respiratory uh, that I've concentrated on uh, because uh, I, th I think this is the, the one that has the, the most confusing concepts. And so that's what I've focused on. And, and it's also the things that I find the most uh, interesting as well myself. Um, so I've, I've tried to uh, do things, particularly people get very confused about VQ mismatch. And so a lot of it is about um, trying to answer questions that confused me when I was studying it. Um, so I'm hoping that people find this useful. Um, but again, the, 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 I think one of the big benefits of this is that you've got a few options. So, I, I, you know, I, I write in my own specific style, um, which you might not really like, but uh, there's um, like the life in the fast lane. This one is, tends to be quite a concise summary of the topic, uh, whereas deranged physiology is a bit more of a deep dive uh, into the topics as well. So depending on, you know, what appeals to you, you've got a few choices um, in terms of uh, yeah, resources that you can try and research a topic on. Hey, Frank, are you constantly looking through deranged physiology and life in the fasting to check if they've updated the website, added more posts, or how, how do you just keep that up to date? Um, that I've, yeah, I only recently added those two in, in the most recent update uh, when I've come across them. Um, yeah, so I guess once in a while, I'll, I'll uh, yeah, just have a look at the websites and, and try and see if there's anything new there. Hmm. Uh, yeah, good. That's great. And then uh, lastly, before you go, Frank, Tudor's Corner, because uh, I think that's something that uh, the consultants who have passed can utilise. Is that is that right? Oh, yeah. So this is what I use to mainly to kind of uh, organise my uh, Viva practice that... Um, so I've done it so you can do different uh, sort of things like, uh, yeah, uh, but I, I usually, I'm mainly using this myself to organize my vivas so that, see, I'm doing viva practice with all of my uh, trainees at the moment. So I've got them all, my uh, vivas organized by the, to the topics, and then you can then add them into a group so that, you know, my, these are the ones that I've recently done. And you can then just very quickly open up that document uh, so it's just, again, it's trying to just help to make it easy to access things. That, that's, that's fantastic. I think that's something that uh, I will uh, have, to, have to sort of use. And those resources that you've got, those are just your ones that you've created and you've just added it into the file here. Is that right? Yeah, so I've yeah, added it myself. And so the difference between this and the My Resources section is that uh, the My Resources once, if you add something there, it'll kind of copy that file into a, a specific uh, resources folder in the My Documents section. Uh, whereas uh, in this Tutors Corner, it, it, it'll just uh, create a link to wherever that file is located so that when you, you know, edit it, it'll, um, yeah, it, I, had to, I did it that way just so that um, when you edit the document, it'll go to the up-to-date version, I guess. Yep. Oh, this is completely amazing. Like the amount of work you've put into this, uh, Frank, uh, what would you say about four years worth of work, a decade worth of work? More than a thousand hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess like uh, I started doing it at the start of 2017 and had the yeah. basic functionality version in, yeah, ready by May 2018. And then I've kind of yeah, just added more and more functionality uh, to it since then. And, and also uh, when uh, the platform that I use, Zojo, they also update you know, their functionality. So it was only recently that they added on being able to make create uh, PDFs. So I kind of was able to add that on. Um, so, and Frank, yeah, where do you see this going then? Like what's, what's your next uh, version? What are you looking for? <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking about what, I, what do I want to do? Um, I think uh, at the moment I'm, focusing on trying to make my included study notes a bit more uh, comprehensive in what they've covered. Uh, so I've almost done everything in respiratory, uh, but also one of the 
one of the things I'm planning to do next is um, to try and do a kind of a, a series of video tutorials on VQ mismatch and hypoxemia, because I, I find that's the topic that's most people seem to get very confused about. Um, so that's my I, next project. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Actually, I, it's funny, I, I get asked that question probably the most commonly of all my res respiratory questions as well. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I can definitely see, you know, the, the space for you know, even like um, videos on good vivas, bad vivas, that kind of thing, you know, how to, like the whole viva techniques type thing, how to answer a question, how not to, and these little pop-ups, uh, yeah, with uh, video links. Hmm. Yeah, and I think it's fantastic now that I, I saw that on, on your series of podcasts, you've got those practice vivas. And then also the ASA runs practice fibers um, that they also record and, and put out as well. And then of course, now there's the ANSCA tr formal trial vibers as well. So I think it's really fantastic that, yeah. Yeah, there's, there, there's so many good good resources out there. And I think that's, the, well, I mean, that's the level playing field, isn't it? You're someone mm. stuck in the country somewhere without the same team. Like I think a lot of us have had when we're going through training, they just don't have the role models and the mentors and the really great examples of, exam technique whatever that might mean so yeah so thank goodness for zoom and you know th there's been some advantages to go with covid a lot of us getting online and learning mm -hmm. how to teach as well yeah and yeah one thing that uh, i found interesting uh, so uh, last year i became a supervisor of training at liverpool and then i was uh, involved in doing the job interviews for this year and so i did uh, the job interviews for the junior registrars and also for our pfs and what I found very interesting uh, was that, uh, you know, we allocated 15 minutes for each um, interview and for the junior registrars who are all, you know, IT sort of level, hadn't done the primary yet. Uh, we went over time uh, for everyone over 15 minutes, whereas for the PF interviews, it was, we used up about half the time each time. And the difference being once you've done your vivas or two sets of vivas uh, for the primary and final exams, you know that you, same for Viva and for interview. You just answer the question and then shut up <laughs> and shorter is better. That's, that's so true. It's funny because I, I've, I've done the same thing. I've become a supervisor of training recently, did interviews for, you know, last year for this year's cohort. And um, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I, I didn't realize whether it was on Zoom or not, but just the style of answering questions, it was definitely like it, they, it felt like they went for a bit longer and, you know, we just let people talk. Um, it'd be interesting to do fellow interviews maybe in the future and uh, see what that looks like. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah very obvious difference in <laughs> the style of answering. Yeah, interesting. This news, though, you're a SOT at our department now. Oh no, like quick care supervisor. Oh you, right, yeah. right. Not, not the saying. proper, not the proper SOT. Just the. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, you tell you what, if if you you are more than qualified to be SOT, but uh, I, don't, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> when when you do the first place you're going to announce it is uh, is going to be here. All right. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> hey, so hey, Frank, I just want, I want to do one final plug so that um, for all those listeners out there who haven't um, or who want to know more about uh, Frank's app or want to download it, you can download it at um, mac95.com with a K, so mak95.com. It's one hundred and thirty-eight dollars, and speaking to trainees, worth every dollar in fact i've had trainees say that they would pay up uh, so don't frank don't don't increase the price for this but i've heard trainees say they would pay 10 times more for this uh for this app just because of the functionality and i can see you know with you doing the deep dive you put so much work into this and it just creates so many efficiencies on so many levels and also a plug to um, all the primary exam tutors or consultants out there, because I know a lot of consultants listen to our podcast. This is a really a great app for, for I think, you guys to also use um, to help with your teaching of trainees. And I think, Frank, you know, you're kind enough to, you know, if you're a consultant, to allow them to access it um, for free. Is that, yeah. is that right? Yes, that, that's correct. Like, I feel like all the tutors... You know, we're already donating enough of our time. Kind of doesn't feel right to be charging them <laughs> to try and help when they're trying to help other people. So yeah, if, if you if they just contact me by email or through the contact form on the website, I'm happy to uh, give them access to it for free. Oh, thanks so much for that. That's really generous, Frank. Yeah. Uh, I kind of just feel feels like it's the right <laughs> thing to do. Yeah.
Hey, so that's great. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say, Frank, while you're here? Uh, no, no, I think that's um, yeah, all the advice I, I, was, I was wanting to, to get across. Because I feel like, um, you know, the way I've designed Mac 95 is to try and help encourage people to, to study the way that I studied. Um, and, I, you know, I don't think there's, uh, I think you, you said it's kind of revolutionized things, uh, but I feel like it's not doing anything that you can't do without it. I guess it just try, kind of just makes it a little bit more time efficient. So uh, that, that's uh, my main goal is to try and help people to save a little bit of time. Yeah, they've got to still do the work. It's just that it's all there ready to go instead of trying to program something yourself, which would be you know, ridiculous if you're about to see your exam. Mm. No, that's great. Hey, thank you so much for your time, Frank. It's just been such a such a joy to talk to you and get your insights and then even just see the evolution of what you've done. It, it, that's just inspiring. Um, so yeah, everyone, thanks very much for watching. If you like this video, please share with anyone who might be interested and um, yeah, we'll see you next time on Anesthesia Coffee Break.